I'll show you how to use Affinity Photo's procedural texture filter to apply non-destructive tone mapping for high dynamic range imagery. Ordinarily, you would tone map by entering the tone mapping persona, which will give you a significant amount of control over the result. But you may prefer to maintain a non-destructive layer stack and shape the tones manually using adjustment layers. This is a 360 by 180 equirectangular image, which we will look at tone mapping shortly. But to begin with, I'm going to HDR merge some bracketed exposures together into an HDR document. To do this, I'll go to File, New HDR Merge. Choose Add. Select the JPEGs here and click Open to add them to the images list. Then before clicking OK, I'll uncheck Noise Reduction and Tone Map HDR Image. The crucial option here is unchecking Tone Map HDR Image. When the HDR document is created, this will stop Affinity Photo from automatically entering the tone mapping persona. And instead, we will end up in the main photo persona with the sources panel showing and the clone brush tool selected. I'll use H to switch to the view tool and now it's time to apply this non-destructive tone mapping. I'll go to Layer, New Live Filter Layer, Colors, Procedural Texture. This filter is incredibly powerful as it allows you to perform various mathematical functions and operations on pixel values in the document. I'll click the plus icon three times to create equation fields for the red, green, and blue channels. The document turns pure black because we are currently returning zero in each field. Let's start by clicking into the red field and I'll type R divided by open bracket R plus one, close bracket, then use return or enter. We will see the red channel return, this time with the high dynamic range sky detail visible instead of being clipped. I'll repeat the process for the green channel and the blue channel. So, if I expand the pixel layer, then hide the procedural texture layer, you can see the before result, where the high dynamic range pixel values are unbounded and clipped. Then once I show the layer, those values are transformed into standard dynamic range. The reason this works is because of the simple equation here. With HDR documents, pixel values are represented in floating point format, and the 0 to 1 range is used to represent standard dynamic range values. Any values outside of 0 to 1 are considered high dynamic range. For example, let's say one of the pixel values in the bright sky detail here is originally 1.85. This is greater than 1 and so cannot be represented on a traditional standard dynamic range display. If we were to apply the equation to this, we would take the original value of 1.85 and divide it by itself plus 1, which is 2.85. And that gives us approximately 0.65, a value well within standard dynamic range. The tonal compression becomes greater the higher the value. For example, if we had a darker standard dynamic range pixel value of 0.3, dividing this by 1.3 would result in approximately 0.23. So the intensity of the darker pixel is not greatly reduced. Conversely, an extremely bright pixel value of 30 divided by 31 would equal roughly 0.97 when rounded, which is just within the upper bounds of standard dynamic range. So the higher the value, the greater the compression. For example, 100 divided by 101 would fall just under 1, so still within standard dynamic range. Let's add some complexity to this equation, which will ultimately give us more flexibility with the tone mapping. First, I'm going to click down here to add a basic 0 to 1 range input, which is user controllable. This is mapped to the variable A. We're now going to create two variants of this result and give ourselves the ability to blend between them dynamically. First, I'll wrap this calculation in a square root function. I'll type SQRT, 
open bracket, then add a closed bracket at the end. The square root function will increase any pixel value less than 1, which raises the darker tones. And I'll just do this for the green and blue channels. At the start of the equation, I'll now add a linear interpolation function, which can be expressed with lerp or LERP. I'll add an open bracket, and then the result of this calculation will be the first input for the linear interpolation. I'll move to the end of the equation line and add a comma and a space. For the second input, I'll use the calculation without the square root function, so just R divided by open bracket R plus 1 close bracket. Finally, I'll add another comma, then type A and close bracket. A is referencing the 0 to 1 range input here. Now I need to do the same for the other two channels. At this point, it would be quicker to copy and paste the equation from the red channel, then just change the channel reference being used. Once I'm done, I can then use the slider here to control the blend between the square root result and the original calculation. This gives me more flexibility with scenes where additional compression of the darker tones may be required, or if I simply want to create a more tonally compressed image as a starting point. Something else we can do is also make the 1 value mutable. I can add a real number input, which by default will be mapped to the variable b. I'll set this to 2 for now, then I'll swap out every instance of 1 in the equations with a lowercase b. Case sensitivity does matter here because the capital B refers to the blue channel information. Once this has been done, I can now gain even finer control over the tone compression. For example, I could increase the value here, then bring the slider to the left for even more aggressive compression of the pixel values. For completeness, I could give these inputs friendly labels. I'll reset the values to suitable starting points. Then I will try and choose meaningful descriptions. The 0 to 1 range slider almost acts like a gamma transform control, so I might choose to call this gamma. The real number input I might call compression scaling. Since it can be used to further compress tones when combined with the newly named gamma control. Now at this point, you would of course use adjustment layers such as curves and other techniques to shape the tones further. But for now I'm going to save this as a preset so it can be reused on other imagery. In fact, I will actually record a macro to make the process of adding this to other imagery even quicker. I'll click on the options icon here and choose create preset. I'll call the preset tone mapping. You don't have to save presets into an explicit category, so I'll leave this set to none for now and click Create. Now I'll close this dialog down and delete the procedural texture layer. I'll open the macro panel by going to Window, Macro, and I'll click the Record button to start recording. First, I may want my tone mapping layer to always apply at the top of the layer stack as a parent layer, rather than it being clipped into the currently selected layer. One easy way to achieve this is to use Select, Deselect Layers. Then I'll add a live procedural texture filter layer, and I'll change the preset to Tone Mapping. Then I'll close the dialog, and at this point I can stop recording, then choose Add to Library. I'll put this macro into the default category for now and call it Tone Mapping, then click OK. The library panel opens automatically to reveal the newly created macro. And now I can use this on any HDR imagery I am working with. So I could now 
go back to the 360 by 180 HDR image we saw at the beginning of this video, and I could quickly apply the tone mapping macro to it. I will click on the procedural texture layer icon to bring the dialog up, and I'll increase the compression scaling and experiment with the gamma slider until I end up with a good result. The major benefit to using this approach for 360 imagery is that the image will remain seamless. The tone mapping persona is not seam aware, so typically after applying the tone mapping, you would notice a very obvious seam where the left and right sides of the image join up. With this non destructive procedural texture method, however, seam artifacting is no longer a concern. As you can see here, whilst I'm click dragging around the projected image. And I can then take this further with other adjustment layers. So, for example, I'll add a curves adjustment above the procedural texture layer to create a final tone mapped result with suitable contrast. So, that was a video on using the procedural texture filter for non destructive tone mapping. I hope you found it useful. And thank you for watching.